Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Roger Waldinger, Professor of Sociology, Director of the Center for the Study of International Migration, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's talk, uh, the latest installment in our ongoing collaboration with our friends and colleagues at the Center for, for uh, Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego. Uh, we uh, have uh, actually seven events scheduled this uh, quarter uh, so we have uh, we we for the for most of the past year and a half we've been having a series of book talks but next week we're going to segue to a, a different f format what used to be our usual format that is a research presentation uh, with the talk by professor nancy green of the école des hautes études sciences sociales in paris who will be talking to us about transnationalism and walls history and uh, limits. But uh, now I want to uh, begin, se uh, let's segue to today's focus, and I'm uh, delighted that we have this opportunity to talk about a terrific uh, new book authored by uh, Ashley Johnson Bavery called Bootleg Aliens, Immigration Politics on America's Northern Borders. And Ashley will talk to us for 20 to 30 minutes presenting the highlights of uh, her book. Uh, we initially were scheduled to have a comment from Professor Toby Higby in the UCLA History Department, but unfortunately there's a death in Professor Higby's uh, family, so he's not able to join us. And instead, uh, David Fitzgerald has very kindly volunteered to step in. So we'll hear some reactions from David and then we uh, a response from Ashley, and then we'll segue to discussion. So in the discussion portion of the meeting, if you could just please raise your hand or send me a comment, uh, and then uh, I will call on you. Okay, without any further ado, uh, Professor Bavery, floor is yours. Great, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much for making time to talk with us. Great, uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, and that everyone can, that works for everyone, right? Great. All right, thank you so much to uh, UCSD Center for Comer Comparative Immigration Studies and UCLA Center for the Study of Immer International Migration for hosting me in your series and to Roger Waldinger and David Fitzgerald for inviting me and arranging the details. And thank you all for coming out on Zoom. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your lunch or um, later if you happen to be on the East Coast. Uh, so I'm gonna give a fairly brief overview of my book, uh, Bootlegged Aliens, Immigration Politics on America's Northern Border, which looks at the immigration uh, politics in Detroit before World War II. Uh, so my work in particular looks at the individual histories of migrants and uh, I draw on their deportation records and other local archival records as well to help us understand how unauthorized immigration operated in the North in particular and some of its consequences for larger immigration policy. Uh, so I'll start how I often like to start talks, which is with uh, the story of one of these immigrants who is affected by uh, these immigration politics. So, and he's one of many, but we'll start with him uh, in particular. So this is Aleko Nick Lafsanov. And in 1927, uh, he's 25 years old and he's uh, living in Albania and he wants to come to the United States to join his brother who works in Detroit at Henry Ford's Highland Park factory. Uh, but I, the 1924 Immigration Act meant that he couldn't get a quota visa to come to the United States. His brother had come uh, several years before and had avoided the quota system and come in fairly easily uh, through Ellis Island. Uh, so instead of uh, heading straight to Detroit like he'd planned, he takes uh, an ocean liner to Canada. And we don't know whether he wanted to stay in Canada or he might have intended to smuggle across the border immediately to visit his brother. Uh, but regardless, he worked in Toronto for a few years uh, before he made a contract with a Bulgarian American smuggling ring, which actually specialized in bringing Eastern Europeans across the border uh, at Detroit. And uh, the smuggling ring supervised every step of his journey. They helped him cross the border for 20, $125, which was a steep rate at the time. They brought him to Windsor 
uh, Canada, and we'll look at some photos in a minute of Windsor. And they took him here uh, and uh, three other immigrants in a small boat and rowed them across the Detroit River. And here's just on the left, here's a photo of the immigration inspection station at Windsor that he's actually trying to avoid. So he would have been rejected at this immigration st station uh, because he didn't have a quota visa. Um, so, but once he gets uh, to Detroit um, or to uh, Windsor, uh, the uh, group or uh, the smuggling ring uh, takes him and three other immigrants in a small boat and rows them across the Detroit River. And here's, uh, and then a taxi is actually waiting for him on the shore and a local boarding house uh, takes him in that specializes in lodging recent arrivals and uh, they're waiting for him as well. And pretty quickly, uh, he found work sweeping the floors of Henry Ford's Highland Park plant. Probably his brother helped him get the job. And he really felt that he made it. But life in Detroit for someone like Lassenop, who did not have legal entry papers, uh, came with major struggles. Uh, in 1914, Henry Ford had offered a $5 day, but Lassenop, who had no entry papers, couldn't qualify for this wage. He actually probably made he, his deportation record says that he made one to two dollars a day, depending on the day. If he demanded uh, more money or asked for more hours, his foreman could easily tell local immigration authorities and have him hauled off for questioning. Uh, and this would have also helped keep his brother, who did have legal papers, in check as well. He would have been worried about his brother being discovered. Uh, and he also confronted regular nativism uh, in the streets of Detroit. On his way to work each day, Lassenoff saw graffiti that urged him to leave the city and keep America for the Americans. One afternoon, he happened on a Ku Klux Klan in Detroit, and here's a photo of that from the Detroit newspaper of a Ku Klux Klan rally in 1926. Um, and the Klan was specialized at this time in focusing on uh, Catholic and Jewish immigrants in particular. And uh, one of their main mantras was keep out what they called the criminal foreigners. Uh, so naturally he was pretty, pretty worried and scared by this. Uh, but he kept his head down. He managed to live in the shadows of American industrial life for a couple of years before a policeman stopped him on the street one day, uh, asked for his uh, migrate his papers, uh, which he didn't have, and sent him to the Immigration Bureau for questioning. Uh, by the summer of 1929, local authorities sent Lafsanoff on deportation train to New York, where he boarded a steam ship back to Europe. So today I'm going to use the stories of immigrants like Lafsanoff to talk about how severe and discriminatory immigration restrictions shaped America's relationship to foreigners in Detroit. And here we see, okay, here's Detroit. Uh, and so here's Detroit uh, in the 1920s. And Detroit, of course, I'll talk about in a minute, is this booming industrial center, but um, the Secretary of Labor, who's in charge of immigration at this time, also calls Detroit the illegal capital of America and the Ellis Island of the Midwest. There's this concern that uh, immigrants are crossing the border and coming through Ellis Island at this time. And so, uh, and coming through this area at this time to avoid regulations at Ellis Island. And so here, new policies combine with coercive enforcement, and they link certain Europeans to crime and make xenophobia really a permanent part of the law. And this brings me to my kind of second larger point, which demonstrates that in industrial Detroit, uh, automobile manufacturers avoided and sometimes in, uh, benefited from inconvenient immigration laws and they by, the, by advertising work in Windsor factory branches and employing unauthorized immigrants like Lafsanoff. So this system foreshadows a later trend that we, we know in which employers on the US-Mexico border thwart border laws by building border factories um, and encouraging undocumented immigration so that they can employ people at lower wages. 
And so in both the 1920s and today, uh, despite the fact that unauthorized workers perform necessary work, uh, their presence in America has been deeply troubling uh, to a range of policymakers. So, um, and also they've been uh, received pushback from uh, unions and uh, native born citizens as well. So we'll look at how this plays out in the 1920s, in particular in Detroit, but a lot of these patterns would have been playing out in other industrial centers in the North as well in similar ways. So I'm using Detroit as a case study to look at this larger phenomena of un what it meant to be unauthorized in the United States in the 1920s. Okay, so let's begin really briefly by taking a look at the 1924 Immigration Act. So we all know the story of 19th and 20th century immigration to America, it's this kind of iconic story of the Irish, Germans, Italians, and Poles relieving famine and poverty and uh, coming through Ellis Island. And the emphasis is always that they come in legally, they wait their turn. This is something that politicians talk about time and time again, right? Uh, immigrants of the past waited their turn, new immigrants need to do that as well. Uh, but after 19, after World War I, the number of Eastern Europeans coming into the United States spiked and policymakers begin to argue about what to do to keep them out. So of course, they come up with these quotas uh, that keep out uh, particularly Southern Eastern Europeans, as uh, many of you know. So the new quotas are based on 2% of America's population in 1890. And uh, here you see, um, just want to point out uh, Lafsenov's quota here, Albania, there would have only been 100 Albanians let in to the United States uh, each year, which again was a a number that uh, would have been reserved for a handful of uh, people with connections and dignitaries who would have had no chance of getting a quota visa. So for many Europeans, this kept just uh, ended their possibility of immigrating legally to the United States. Um, and, uh, but one of the things that came out of this is that employers weren't that happy with new quotas. They worried they'd lose their, uh, access to cheap labor. And the auto industry in particular was really concerned about this. But one of the things that the auto industry does immediately to get around this, because they're located, uh, Detroit is a borderland, uh, they start to build uh, branch plants in Windsor, Canada. Uh, Ford of Canada actually had existed since uh, the early 1900s, but it expanded after 1924. Uh, Ford of Canada built two new assembly plants, and then by 1926, Studebaker, Hudson, Chrysler, and GM, GM all had branch plants in Windsor, and they could employ workers more cheaply there, and they could also assemble cars there and send them tax-free to the British Empire. So it was kind of a, a workaround for various um, tax tax laws, but also uh, because they could um, still access some of the inexpensive labor they'd been hoping to access. Um, and here at this photo in the corner to the right, I just want to point out, this shows just how close Windsor is to Detroit. So it gives you an idea. This is Windsor, uh, the shores of Windsor looking across at Detroit. So you can see it's just a very close a boat ride, it would be an easy rowboat, speed boat ride across. And most people at this time were crossing uh, the river by ferry. Um, so there would, be, would have been regular ferries crossing hourly, um, sometimes even half hourly during rush periods um, between the two cities. And so another group that starts coming in to get around uh, these new quotas uh, is that there's, well, there's a surge in unauthorized immigration across uh, this uh, northern border. So between 1924 and 1939, so right before World War II, about between seven and 10,000 immigrants probably crossed illegally into Detroit every year. And again, these numbers or I've come to through various sources and immigration record, records and newspapers and uh, by spending a lot of time with this, uh, but, um, and the, the number is not actually very large, but um, the, there's this, 
uh, they create this growing fear about undocumented undoc and unauthorized immigration that becomes uh, a major issue in the city. And uh, here we see, uh, and they come to Detroit in part because it's uh, the location of a major borderland, and it's very close to Windsor, but also because it's such a major industrial center. Detroit is a boom town at this time. It's America's fourth city in population, and it's its third in industrial product, uh, production. And it looks like it's going to eclipse Chicago at any moment, right? People at the time uh, in newspapers and in magazines are constantly talking about when are we going to overtake Chicago? When is when are we going to become the new uh, center? Uh, and again, it's also America's largest industrial borderland. So we see the development of concerns about unauthorized work and exploitation developing in the industrial Midwest here and focusing on in particular um, some of these uh, migrants coming over. And so migrants came over um, without papers in a variety of ways, but the most, some just came over themselves. They just hid uh, in the crowds of immigration inspect, uh, behind immigration inspectors, particularly before there was a huge, there were, was huge scrutiny of these crowds. But pretty soon after 1924, a huge smuggling network develops uh, in the Detroit Windsor area that caters to Europeans who want to get into the United States. Uh, the smuggling network had existed because uh, for decades, there had been a small network in bringing Chinese over on the border. And uh, there had always, since the beginning of prohibition, there had uh, developed a huge smuggling network uh, that focused on bringing over um, unauthorized liquor across the border. In fact, probably about 80% of the unauthorized liquor uh, coming in and alcohol coming into the United States was coming through uh, the Detroit Windsor, um, across the Detroit Windsor waterway. Um, Al Capone in uh, Chicago notoriously got his uh, alcohol from Detroit and a lot of this the alcohol was distributed across the country as well. So some of the people that were already involved in smuggling uh, liquor or other immigrants turned to what seemed like a lu lu lucrative business in smuggling um, unauthorized Europeans. And they did this in a variety of ways. They brought them over here. You see a picture um, which is taken by the border patrol in uh, the 1920s of smuggling immigrants over in rowboats. Uh, they brought them in uh, larger ships, uh, in, um, uh, in the bottom of truck compartments. They brought them, there's one case of bringing them over in uh, ventilated coffins, um, perhaps most notoriously in the winter, the um, Detroit River and in particular the St. Clair River in the North would freeze over and uh, Smugglers, smugglers would bring over immigrants that cover them in sheets and bring them across the ice. And they, um, and they call this practice ghost walking. And so they bring all of these crowds of immigrants across uh, covered in sheets and immigration inspectors and the border patrol said that they couldn't see them against the backdrop of snow and ice. And they complained that it was impossible to detect them. So again, and a lot of these stories are sensationalized, but they, they get at the idea that there's this huge network of um, unauthorized smuggling that's starting to take root in this area and becoming a very important and one of the ways that immigrants are getting into the United States. And some of them are staying in Detroit and others are moving quickly to other places across the industrial uh, Midwest and even um, to the East Coast as well. So Detroit is one entry point for them. And so um, we also see uh, it pretty quickly after uh, 1924, the 1924 Immigration Act, uh, Congress allows uh, $1 million for the establishment of the US Border Patrol. And because there's so much smuggling along the Detroit Windsor border, uh, they allocate a lot of attention and resources to Detroit. So there's this big focus on policing the Detroit Windsor border at this time. Uh, in Detroit in particular, uh, this is the route, here's the um, a photo, uh, a map of the time. So 50 officers would patrol the region here in the north, in Port Huron, uh, to Toledo in the south. And these were all the areas that people were worried 
um, unauthorized immigrants were crossing. And, and the, the fact that there are armed police armed and militarized police patrolling the border regularly with military tactics and weapons um, really helped militarize the border and associate unauthorized immigrants with crime. Uh, and it also moves the practice of finding immigrants beyond just points of entry and inspection stations. Uh, now we have uh, border patrol who are actually going into patrolling, physically patrolling the border, going into workplaces, and also deputizing police to do this work as well. So they're working with the local police department to ask them to find unauthorized immigrants um, in places of work and in boarding houses and things. Uh, and so what we see in response to this is that some of the nativism that had helped pass the 1924 Immig Immigration Act uh, doesn't actually go away after it, but it actually surges. Uh, after the 1924 Immigration Act. And new, the new focus of nativism shifts from um, keeping out uh, criminal foreigners to, or uh, undesirable foreigners, uh, to focusing on uh, keeping out unauthorized immigrants. And so um, they start to focus on this new perceived crime that they can kind of label these uh, these new immigrants with. And this helps associate entire neighborhoods with unauthorized immigration. And here on the left, we see a Ku Klux Klan rally in 1925. And the Ku Klux Klan is obsessed with, um, with uh, unauthorized immigrants at this time in Detroit in particular. And they constantly are inflating the numbers that they think uh, undocumented immigrants are living in the city. And the American Legion also focuses a lot on um, in immigration and in particular on uh, keeping unauthorized immigrants out and associating particular immigrant groups with crime and unauthorized crossing. So this, again, you see this um, elision then developing between the idea of an unauthorized immigrant or just a non-citizen who doesn't have papers, right? People start to, in some of these nativist groups, start to use both um, terminology and kind of associate all, all groups who look foreign with crime with unauthorized crossing. Um, and so a huge focus of these nativist groups is the failure of immigration quotas, and they inflate unauthorized immigration numbers. So in reality, um, it's not turning. Yeah. In reality, there are probably about uh, 10,000 unauthorized Europeans in Detroit, maybe 300,000 across the nation tops. Uh, but the American Coalition, which is a major nativist organization out of Washington, uh, famously speculated that 2 million unauthorized immigrants are had entered the United States since 1924. And there are all these fears about undermining the workforce, um, undermining all sorts of American values. And what happens out of this is that, in particular, is important in Detroit because uh, the labor industry, the uh, the um, major labor union at this time, the Detroit Federation of Labor, becomes obsessed with uh, keeping unauthorized immigrants out of the country and ending unauthorized immigration, and they focus on the idea that unauthorized <laughs> immigrants are taking America taking the jobs of uh, union workers and keeping them from being able to strike. And the Detroit Federation of Labor here, you pictured their letterhead, is a subsidiary of the larger American Federation of Labor. It represented skilled workers, uh, but the DFL really wanted to diversify and get into the automobile industry. They wanted to organize the auto industry. They wanted to um, be the first per first group that uh, was able to organize the auto industry, which had famously been uh, impossible to organize. And Detroit was actually known as being a trade union desert at this time. So it seemed like an impossible task. Uh, but their president, Frank Martel, becomes obsessed with uh, the idea that if he can just stop unauthorized immigration to the city, then he'll be able to organize the auto industry. 
And so he runs two major campaigns in between 1926 and 1931. Um, the first is to end the practice of Canadian uh, day labor uh, coming across. So in um, 1926, uh, there had been about between five and 10,000 people who lived in Canada and uh, commuted across the river every day. Some of them were Canadians. Uh, a lot of them were British uh, people of, um, British descent who were crossing the river every day who had British passports in some cases. Uh, and a lot of them are also Southern and Eastern Europeans who'd realized that they could move uh, to Windsor and then find jobs at particularly, particularly in auto plants across uh, the river and would cross every day. Uh, and so in 1926, between 1926 and 1927, uh, the Detroit Federation of Labor lobbies tirelessly to end the practice of um, commuting, uh, they call it, or uh, ending day labor. And they focus in particular um, so they, and they see it as an economic issue, but they start to focus in particular on emphasizing the racial and ethnic threat that um, commuters pose to industrial America. And so that's what they use. They kind of tap into nativist ideas to get their ideas, to get uh, support for ending commuting um, across the river. And here, I'm just gonna show you a cartoon really quickly from um, the, this is from the Detroit Labor News in 1927. And this is uh, showing an evil commuter coming across and he's coming across, here's the um, bridge, which has just been, was about, actually about to be built, was about to open. And um, here he's crossing, and this is order 86, which is the order that allows commuters to continue crossing and gives them special status to continue. And uh, note that um, I know the drawing here is difficult to see, but he's depicted as being swarthy, as having and many of the depictions of these commuters, they have darker skin, uh, which would not have been true. They were mostly people of British descent who are coming across, uh, but they really, Martel and the heads of the DFL really focus on emphasizing the, um, that they're foreigners. They emphasize, oh, they must all be Jewish coming over here. They must be Catholics. Um, and they tap into this surge of nativism uh, that, um, and so employers eventually have to kind of back down and um, most of them let go the commuters who'd been crossing, many of them for decades for jobs uh, in the United States. They gave them an ultimatum. They either had to move to Detroit and uh, take out residency in the city, or uh, they had to give up their jobs and uh, stay in Windsor. And uh, next, the DFL becomes uh, obsessed with lobbying, perhaps more importantly, uh, to pass an act to register all non-citizens in uh, the state of Michigan. And so this runs uh, throughout 1931, or throughout 1930, and then in 1931, Michigan actually passes the first uh, major registration act uh, in the country. And uh, the... Uh, they really focus on registering all immigrants. And, uh, and again, this moves beyond focusing on unauthorized immigrants. Here, the Detroit Federation of, of Labor is focusing on anyone who is a non-citizen. And again, so you see, and they're using, but they're using the language that comes with, oh, these immigrants are criminal. They probably don't have papers. Uh, we need to get them registered to make sure that they're legally here. Um, and this causes a tremendous backlash from um, ethnic and uh, also most of immigrant Detroit at this time. So there's a tremendous backlash from the Jewish community and uh, the Catholic community as well during this time. Um, just kind of trying to move through some of these things. Uh, this has major consequences for labor. Um, and so in a city where lots of workers may not have been undocumented themselves, but they had an unauthorized parent, a brother, maybe a boarder they didn't want discovered. Uh, they, it, it made a lot of um, immigrants in the city 
shy away from organizing. So, and this became clear in 1933 uh, during the Briggs strike. So in January of 1933, uh, 12,000 workers go on strike at Briggs Body Company. Uh, and uh, because Briggs actually provided auto bodies to Ford, 100,000 workers couldn't work because Briggs was on strike. And this went on for three months, uh, but uh, immigrant workers, even legal workers, really shied from the picket lines. And uh, I argue here that it was because their only experience in some cases with, uh, the, with labor was with the Detroit Federation of Labor, which had waged such a nativist campaign for so long against them. Uh, and the Detroit Federation of Labor is involved in this strike, even though, the, though there are other unions who are also trying to organize uh, the labor in, or the auto industry at this time. And the strike ultimately fails. So uh, we also see out of this, uh, oh, here's the Briggs strike. Uh, we see employers also are beginning to actively employ unauthorized immigrants. Uh, they find that they're cheaper. And this isn't in the official Ford records I've looked, but uh, the deportation files of the National Archives uh, have hundreds of immigrants who tell inspectors that they worked at Ford. And Ford, execs, all, Ford executives uh, also would stage uh, public deportations, and this is in the records, and it kept workers in line. Uh, they wouldn't ask for higher wages. Uh, they were afraid to strike. Uh, they, you know, were worried about not getting welfare in times of layoffs as well. And so kind of the point that I'm going to end with is that this really matters for the New Deal, uh, because the politics of casting foreigners as outsiders begins, begins to associate all immigrants, authorized or not, with crime and welfare cheating. And so, and with kind of cheating the system, this has becomes, becomes a major narrative in the city. Uh, in 1938, Mayor Richard Redding wins the Detroit, or Richard Redding wins the Detroit mayoral, mayoral race as a Republican candidate on the slogan, end the welfare chiseling. And so he goes on and on about how people are chiseling at the welfare state and they're uh, taking money from uh, good deserving Americans. And he attributes uh, most of this welfare ch chiseling to foreigners. The idea that foreigners are the ones who are uh, taking money from the state. And finally, um, so local politicians begin lobbying policymakers in Washington then to keep foreigners off New Deal benefits eventually. And they begin demanding that citizenship be a prerequisite -re for in particular for WPA work. And I think this was the case because the WPA was such a public program. It had people working here we see in Detroit, people are work, uh, working in the streets, paving the streets and uh, the the WPA citizenship um, clause passes in 1939, and it costs 10,000 uh, Detroit workers their jobs. And, and this is in Detroit alone. This would have affected, uh, in, uh, taken effect across industrial America. Uh, and so to sum things up, you know, my book is really trying to demonstrate how America's first major immigration decisions in 1924 criminalized ethnic Europeans and created a space for an uneven and exploitative alliance between capitalist employers and these unauthorized laborers. And the enduring politics of nativism then worked to exclude non-citizens from government benefits. And this pattern, of course, continues to have devastating consequences for ethnic and minority groups negotiating America's borders today. So we see some of these things playing out um, developed in the industrial north in the 1920s. Uh, thank you so much. I'll end there and uh, can ask, uh, and I'll, I'll turn it over to David. I'll stop the share here. David, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks uh, very much uh, for that presentation and for the opportunity to read this book. Uh, from where I'm sitting right now in my neighborhood in San Diego, I can see across the southern border of the US into Mexico. And that's obviously been the site of the overwhelming 
debate around uh, borders and immigration in the US. So it's especially gratifying to learn more about uh, a focus on the northern border and the opportunity to reflect on what is similar and different um, about these two contexts, as well as the historical origins of US border and immigration control. I think that bootlegged aliens is really required reading for those of us who are working on histories of border enforcement, irregular migration, and ethno-racial politics as they played out in the spheres of labor, migration, and social welfare in North America. Let me talk about three reasons why I think this book is so relevant, uh, and especially relevant today. One is that the story of early irregular European immigration has not been widely told. And this book shows irregularity in the lives of particular people with names and families. It's an important intervention in the public history of US immigration. It also has important implications for the scholarly debates about hierarchies of assimilability and possibilities of citizenship along racialized line during this period. A reminder of just how serious discrimination was against despised Eastern European immigrants at the same time as discrimination was even harsher against Mexican and Chinese immigrants. So Detroit is really a strategic site for a case study because it included significant numbers of all of those populations. So uh, that's a set of conditions that's, that's pretty rare in the US at that time. And then the, one of the second, well, the second thing that I really enjoyed about this is the, the analytical approach, which was to look at policies and politics on both sides of the US-Canada border and their interactions uh, with each other, um, but also between local actors and their federal capitals. And I think that that approach is especially useful in the North American context because all three of the countries have extremely long borders, a long uh, history of sustained migration and other forms of mobility and federal systems of government. So that's a model that we can take into many other contexts within North America. And then third is that bootlegged aliens shows the relationship between long-term immigration and other kinds of flows of people and goods. It attends to commuter migration from Windsor to Detroit. And commuter migration is interesting, it's understudied, it's sociologically distinct from temporary and permanent immigration. Consumers are desired by employers because the workers are more or less human machines or excluded from membership in the polity. They go back to their uh, sites of uh, reproduction at the end of the day. So in that way, they're, they're more like temporary workers, but they're without many of the disadvantages to employers uh, because there's not such a high turnover and commuter workers can continue in the same firm for, for many years. So sociologically, it's a very interesting type. We, we need more studies of the phenomenon of commuter migration. And I was also interested to learn that the border crossing cards that make commuter work migration legal uh, for workers in the Detroit Windsor corridor set a legal precedent for those cards uh, first in the uh, Tijuana-San Diego sector, and then across the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, so th th that's a particularity of border communities that's still very much with us and evidently began in uh, the Windsor-Detroit corridor. Then there's the connection between trade and immigration policies. As we've just heard, um, U.S. auto manufacturers established branches in Canada to get around Canadian tariff laws and also to gain better access to the British imperial marketplace at the time and to circumvent U.S. quota laws by maintaining access to immigrant labor in Canada. The, the final way that we see an interaction with other forms of uh, mobility and, uh, and cross-border exchange is interaction between the smuggling of people and the illegal goods of alcohol then and drugs now. Uh, there's more of a direct link, I think, in the story that's told um, in Detroit back in the 20s and 30s during, during Prohibition, um, then in the contemporary case of drugs and their involvement with US-Mexico people smuggling. But nevertheless, it's always an empirical question that, that shifts over time. And this gives us a much better historical uh, sense of how that developed. So I had you know, many, many questions were raised by the book, but I'm going to confine myself to raising just uh, two questions slash comments. 
Uh, so the first is that the, uh, the book, and I quote here, it seeks to demonstrate that it is impossible to fully understand how immigration, welfare, and citizenship laws develop without telling a profoundly local story. And I'm absolutely convinced that the local level is important, but I'm less uh, certain about the specificity of local innovations in the Detroit Windsor region in the 20s and 30s and how they interacted with innovations in other regions. The book states that the 1920s Quota Act created, quote, a regulatory apparatus on the US-Canada border that would bring policing and federal regulation to local communities for the first time. But Patrick Edinger's work, which is cited in the book, it shows all manner of controls on the US-Canada border going back even earlier to the late 19th century. Uh, the Border Patrol was founded in 1924, as we know. It's fascinating that half of the agents were on the northern border then, unlike the roughly 10% who were there now. But it's not clear what was unique about border enforcement in the north beyond the authorities relatively greater attention to uh, Europeans attempting to circumvent those controls. Now, the author never claims that this book is a work of comparison. It's an in-depth case study of Detroit Windsor, but it is engaging with other histories. Um, certainly in the, uh, this comes across in the, in the notes, um, examining migration and border control at the same time in other regions, such as various points of the US-Mexico border, as well as Cuba as sort of a, of a backdoor entry point. So the question here is, can you summarize what's particular about control in your case? And how does that change the big picture origin story of US border policy? The second uh, point that I would like to push the author on is that the book argues that there's a causal chain linking exclusionary practices then and now. So for example, one of the major themes is how local police worked with federal authorities and immigration enforcement. And the author argues there are long lasting legacies of this Northern model of border enforcement and immigration enforcement and border communities on the immigrants access to work and public benefits. The conclusion brings us all the way up to the Trump era. So this is an historical work, but there's a lot of attention to what are the relevant lessons today. And there's a, a strong story here of continuity. But how do we explain the relatively greater accommodation of immigrants in contemporary policing, given the relentless history of targeting uh, in the earlier period? In 2007, the Detroit City Council passed an ordinance instructing several things. Uh, one of them is that city employees had to provide equal services to all residents, regardless of citizenship. It also instructed that uh, police not profile based on immigration status or solicit a person's immigration status to ascertain their compliance with federal law or inquire about the immigration status of victims or witnesses or people seeking the help of the police. So how can we understand that shift to a relatively more accommodating local policing policy today alongside this indisputable history of exclusion and other domains that the book does tell. The book points out that local policing of immigration laws through raids back in the 1930s was devastating to ethnic communities, even when pretty, a pretty small number of people were actually deported, tens of thousands were interrogated, threatened, arrested, um, because police used racial profiling when making their stops. A lot of US born citizen children maybe adult children, uh, were directly harmed by these policies, not to mention all of the indirect harms. And we would presume that those kinds of practices had negative consequences for police community relations and effective law enforcement. So is today's more accommodating stance a backlash to some of the problems caused by the harsh policing described in the book? Or maybe there's not even a historical memory of those problems today, which is what I would guess. Regardless, the various versions of sanctuary cities, whether or not that term is used explicitly uh, in a local context, it suggests that the narrative arc emphasizing continuity and exclusion is leaving out some important changes in policy as a response to immigration and policing and access to at least some kinds of social services at the local level. And those also need um, explanation. So, 
thanks again for writing this truly thought-provoking contribution, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, David, for that terrific comment. Okay, back to you, Ashley. Great, thank you so much, David, those, for those great comments and uh, so many great things to think about. Uh, so a couple of things that I'd just be on, begin to respond to some of your questions with. Uh, so you ask about um, what this local story of um, Detroit and citizenship in Detroit can tell us about kind of the long history of uh, immigration uh, in Detroit, which is, you know, I picked Detroit because it is, a, it's a unique in that it's, uh, you know, an industry, it's the only um, major industrial border or the biggest major industrial border um, crossing at this time, uh, perhaps uh, followed then by Buffalo, uh, New York. Um, but it also encapsulates a lot of the issues that are taking place in the 1920s um, in industry across the country. So you see a lot of these same. So I use Detroit here and I use it as a um, case study. Um, and I think it's important to look at Detroit because uh, a lot of these issues are really emphasized and exacerbated in the city by the fact that there's a border here um, or there, <laughs> I happen to be here. Uh, but uh, also there's the fact that uh, a lot of these immigrants are then moving uh, to places like Chicago, to Cleveland, to Toledo, to New York City, to even north to Boston as well, across the industrial north and the Midwest and finding, so they're using Detroit as an entry point. And you see um, sometimes to a greater or lesser extent, um, these politics and policies taking root in these uh, other industrial settings as well. So I'd say, um, I'm using Detroit here to give him a larger history of the industrial North and the industrial Midwest in the 1920s and 30s and looking at what it meant to be an unauthorized immigrant at this time, or also uh, pretty soon an immigrant who is living in a place where there, where there is a large unauthorized population uh, at the time and how the politics of fear um, of deportation is starting to play out. And that will, that will linger uh, until pretty much until the post-war era. And that kind of um, brings me to kind of the, the next question that you ask, which is kind of the causal chain between then and now, which is something I've kind of struggled with and uh, debated and thought about. Um, and I, I hadn't actually, so I didn't actually, when I was uh, writing the book, uh, I didn't want to talk about the contemporary links uh, to the contemporary um, to the Trump administration or to contemporary politics, uh, because you know it was something I had always kind of grappled with. You know how how what is what is the causation here? Uh, but what I do think is that the model that starts to develop in the industrial north at this time, uh, which which yes uh, develops out of a long history of policing and. Uh, profiling that is already going on in the industrial north, but just intensifies during this time and becomes more of a inner, of a national issue. Um, starts to uh, starts to um, one uh, become a major issue on the national level. So um, in the 1920s and 30s and into the 40s, uh, the Border Patrol and the Department of Labor and then later the Department of Justice really starts to focus a lot of their lobbies for more funding on the northern border and focus and they focus on how we need to intensify policing and intensify and literally militarize the northern border. There's this effort to merge the Border Patrol with the Coast Guard uh, that I don't talk about in the book, but that happens in the late 30s. Um, and again, is trying to, and po policymakers in uh, Michigan and across in Buffalo and across the Northern border are um, lobbying on behalf uh, for this, right? To, to really militarize, literally militarize uh, the border patrol. And, uh, but we do see after World War II, the focus on Detroit and border crossing really shifts because a lot of the immigrants who are 
uh, in question here are able to normalize their status. So uh, because of, po I know there's been a lot of work on how uh, after World War II, even unauthorized Europeans are able to um, gain citizenship uh, by proving they've been in the country for a certain amount of time, particularly if they've um, fought in the war as well. And, uh, and then you really see the focus, the things that I'm talking about often then focus uh, and shift to the southern border. And um, I've actually traced some of the actual inspectors and border patrol who are stationed in the north and kind of get their start in the north, then shift um, and start working on the southern border as well. So some of them kind of begin with their kind of militarized tactics um, in places like Detroit, um, to some extent Buffalo as well. And then they end up uh, patrolling the southern border and looking for what they see as similar things, uh, drugs, alcohol, um, concerns about border policing. And then um, they bring their kind of um, nativist ideas about border patrol and they become um, much more racialized ideas against uh, Latinx and uh, other migrants who are crossing the southern border. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for for that um, illuminating reply. So, why don't we now turn to questions? So if anyone wants to raise a question, please uh, raise your hand or send me a chat. Uh, send me a, a question in the chat, and then I can read it out. Uh, uh, let's see, do I see it? Okay, so at the moment, no hands. All right, so then let me, is there a hand? Kathy Kobanak, you should take off your, you're muted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Not, not, not that well. Uh, maybe I'll chat it in. Better, better. Oh, I, I can hear now. You can hear? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Um, my interest is uh, arises from the fact that my paternal grandfather was part of this flow. Um, he came from, from the Ukraine to Canada, to Detroit, and then he returned to Canada for most of his life, and he settled in Canada. And my question is, um, did you, do you have any information about how many um, or what proportion of the people who came from Canada returned to Canada? Uh, I don't have an actual number, but I, I do have, I have seen that story uh, somewhat. I didn't follow that as a trend uh, with return migration uh, to Canada, but, and I hadn't, I hadn't really talked to people for it. You know, I wish uh, later, one of my regrets for the book is that I come and talk to people in the area because as I've been presenting the book more and more in the area, so many people have come up to me and said, oh, well, my grandfather did this. And oh, well, we had an uncle who had this story um, just I moved to the Detroit area recent uh, within the last four or five years. Uh, so it's been kind of a narrative that I've heard and it's kind of reinforced some of the things, you know, I uh, that that I was finding in the records, but um, that I feel like it could have really illuminated a kind of um, given given a, a broader story and kind of I, I would have been able to kind of draw more on some of those uh, narratives of return migration uh, to, in some cases, to Canada. But there are some, in the case of the commuters, at least, um, there were it started out, I think there were 10,000 people commuting every day, and then um, their numbers are reduced to 10 to 5,000 um, in 1926. And then by the end of the Detroit Federation of Labor's lobbies against them, uh, there are only uh, about four or 500 people who are able to cross the border every day. And those are mostly automobile executives and people who are um, higher level uh, people who are employed by um, the major companies in Detroit, which there are a lot of Canadians who cross every day. But, and there are still a lot of, quite a few people who live in Windsor and do cross the border um, or had before um, some of the COVID restrictions. Well, they do now as medical personnel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nurses and doctors. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? 
I see Lauren Duquette at Wayne State says Wayne State students also are, uh, I guess, are, are regular daily commuters. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, since Roger called me, I'm going to just maybe insert myself. So I have your book on my nightstand. Um, I've been reading it because I'm writing about Detroit circa now. Um, well, Michigan more generally. And what's been so fascinating to me is the 100 mile border phenomena that, you know, we often don't think about Michigan as a border state, it's in the background. Um, but what's really interesting is, you know, after 9 11, the first enforcement and removal office in the country is right here on Mount Elliott, well, right over there <laughs> where I'm sitting. Um, and the policing, the realization of enforcement has been ever present, right, since, since that period. Um, the ACLU had put out a really amazing report that you've probably seen, Ashley, um, on the, it's called the long shadow, just all the ways that the ERO office has um, used all kinds of racial profiling techniques to uh, arrest, apprehend, detain, and remove all removable aliens. And so when I was reading your book, I was looking to see, um, you know, how much of, you know, how long, how long that story goes back and, and what you've, what you've told us so far. And what I've learned in the book is that it really is a, a much longer shadow. Um, the population changes, right, from white ethnics to now uh, a more racialized uh, Latino population um, and Arab origin population. So the populations change, but the, the processes and the politics of, of fear are, are similar. And in the period that I, I go back to 1900 in the book I'm writing now, there's so many parallels between the way that Mexicans are treated in the Southwest region and Southern California in terms of using them as strike, you know, as strike breakers, the relationship to the labor union. So there's so many parallels, but the populations are different. And that's really what is so striking to me here, the way that kind of the racialization process just moves from the undesirables of at the turn of the century um, to kind of the period now and taking that long durée really does help us you know we really can understand so much about now by looking to the past so your book I think helps me think about um helps me think about that in in the local context um and so one of the things I was wondering is you know Mexicans were coming from the southwest to Detroit to work on the beet farms in this period and I just wondered like what what did you learn in all of your arch archival research about this population um because I Maybe it's in the book, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, yes, yeah, so there, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so um, Mexicans are coming and working in the beet farms and then in, um, they work in uh, Henry Ford in uh, the uh, Ford Motor Company as well in pretty large numbers until the depression era when they're deported in, uh, um, um, en masse. Uh, and in this case, they're deported. So I talk about how, um, Mexican workers are deported. Uh, also, you see European workers who are being deported during this time and uh, in particular repatriated, although most of them are, it's more of a true repatriation. They're given the, the choice, uh, quote unquote, choice to return and asked to return and fund their trips back across the Atlantic, whereas uh, most Mexicans are being uh, rounded up and by the, by the, mid 1930s are being put on trains and sent back to Mexico on this large scale effort. Um, I do see, I see, um, I, I found evidence, uh, quite a bit of evidence of the Detroit Federation of Labor and other unions being involved and supportive of that process as well. So they're worried as well about, as they're worried about Southern Eastern Europeans, they're also very worried about Mexican workers and uh, there's a focus on kind of keeping them out in the same way, um, even though their numbers are smaller than the huge Southern Eastern European population, but they're still, I think, because despite their small numbers, I think they represent a larger threat than the, or threat to uh, the Detroit Federation of Labor and some of these labor unions and nativists than their actual numbers present. Um, but, um, but they are, yeah, they're a major, a major presence until about the 1930s when they're repatriated or deported, not repatriated. Okay, uh, other questions? All right, well, 
where did you go after? Okay, just you you suddenly shifted uh, position on my screen. It was a bit disorienting, but anyway, um, uh, I guess I wanted to. Well, let let me call on Brandon Leon. I'll come back, Brandon. Yeah. So um, I was just really interesting. Uh, sorry, interested in in when reading this. Um, I guess on how this affects the politics uh, of the left at the time, because. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, there's a clear issue, you know, in the sense of labor, you know what I mean? Like in terms of labor unions and how does this like formulate, like what, um, like, I guess the left like platform is like going forward, like how does this situation between Detroit and Windsor, you know, we talk about the immigration, um, like enforcement and how that reverberates to now, like, you know, those practices to the border, but how does that like split, I guess, like influence the current political um, like development over that time in terms of like the way the left addresses this, like, you know, like maybe, you know, rhetorically they might be different than the right, but in terms of enforcement, we can clearly see the enforcement carries through, right? So I'm kind of interested, like the connection and development of that. Right. That's a great question. That's something that came up a lot in my, as I was kind of grappling with some of these sources and some of these um, individuals uh, who are, uh, in some cases you see, um, I saw the, uh, I talk about the election of Frank Murphy, who's a, um, runs uh, for mayor in Detroit on democratic platform. Um, in 1930, he later becomes governor of Michigan and uh, Supreme Court justice um, of the United States. And, he runs on a leftist platform of uh, on this pro-immigrant leftist platform. He's trying to be kind of open to all. And when he's elected, he finds that the politics of nativism is so virulent in the city that he has to actually preside over kind of wide scale deportations uh, in the city. So he's actually the person in charge uh, of the city when you see Mexican repatriations and also uh, wide scale deportations of Europeans as well. So um, I do find, and that's something that I spent a lot of time kind of trying to figure out and grapple with and you know, understand how this is operating, right? And so I think it's a great question. And by the late 19s, the mid late 1930s when the UAW is trying to organize um, Walter Ruther and the UAW organizers see some of these things that have been happening and they actually actively cater towards um, ethnic workers for, for the first time in some cases for a major union, um, definitely the first time in Detroit. Um, so they're, they send out um, Stanley Novak, Novak, who is uh, uh, Polish to the Polish community and uh, are trying and they cater to also uh, people who had been communists as well involved in the communist party. There's a huge communist thread that I work on uh, throughout the book as well that a lot of immigrants are um, either involved as are com involved in communism, are cast as communists, are um, uh, excluded because they're seen as communists. So there's a huge um, kind of uh, leftist thread that moves through here, but it's it's very it's it's something that comes out that sim similarly you see people who are running on uh, leftist platforms who are uh, then are confronted with the issue of immigration and take very hard line stances. Okay, um, a question. We have to retrieve it. I'm sorry. Uh, from uh, James Lauke at uh, 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 in Bellingham, Washington. And so James' question is a concern, current concern here uh, on the northern border. So he's in Washington, the northern border is that restrictive US policies may be copied by Canadian counterparts. What were the politics of the Canadian government toward the quote commuters in the period you were examining? That's a great question. And so I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but I do in the book. And so Can Canada is furious about uh, the, um, about their citizens being stopped at the border, and they and the U.S. State Department actually uh, pleads with the American Federation of like pleads with the American Federation of Labor and the Detroit Federation of Labor to back off and says, you know, we don't need to turn this local border issue into an international concern. And so there are all these records in Ottawa where um, the Canadian government sees this as 
an, a major affront to um, friendly relations with Canada. And they think that uh, Canadians, uh, particularly those of British descent, but they say all people of, with Canadian citizenship uh, sh or subjecthood at this time should be able to cross uh, the border. Uh, and you know it has to do with the friendly relations between the US and Canada. And at this time though, uh, Canada had pretty fairly open immigration policies uh, towards Southern and Eastern Europeans. They had enacted um, a set of laws, immigrate, immigration restrictions in 1925 and 1926, but they, um, immig Southern Eastern Europeans only had to promise that they were going to be farm laborers in um, the Western provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta, Alberta, and they were allowed to come in and work. And some people came and worked um, in the farms for a little while and then left. Um, and smuggled across the border south, and some never actually made it there. So it was something that uh, they could they could get around. Okay. Other questions? So if not, let let me let me pose a question. I guess you know here I, what, what I'm interested in is trying to uh, see whether you would address broader historiographical issues mm -hmm. and uh, to ask. Uh, what are the implications, what are the significance for, of, of your book for the broader debates about race and ethnicity uh, in American life, and in particular uh, for the debate launched, I guess, 30 years ago about whiteness, whitening. And, and so, I mean, in many respects, that, that debate essentially, rather than, I mean, to, in, in the social sciences, there's a great deal of talk uh, about ethnic boundaries and understanding that ethnic boundaries can uh, can vary in the degree of their boundedness. Uh, but here, I mean, the, the whiteness literature really uh, focuses on the categorical nature of the divide. One is either on one side of it or another. And, and of course, a central aspect of the argument that, well, I mean, if we think about um, uh, the book about Italians, I'm blanking on his name. Um, uh, Guglielmo is uh, right. Excuse me, Thomas oh, Guglielmo. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's uh, are you white on arrival, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that Italians are white on arrival in part because, of course, their, their, their eligibility for citizenship is never in question. But in fact, of course, what once, but I mean, another way of thinking about this uh, is to think rather in turn, rather than as uh, this is a categorical matter, but rather that it's a, it's a continuum and that what we're talking about is really degrees of acceptability or degrees of belongingness or degrees of foreignness. And, and so if one thinks, it, it, it seems to me that, you know, your book suggests that that's a better, better, a much better perspective. And, and, and so that it's true that the eligibility for citizenship was never in for, for European immigrants was never in question, but what certainly did change was access to citizenship. The citizenship became much more difficult to obtain after 1906, it became a much more bureaucratic process people uh, came under much higher levels of scrutiny. Uh, once um, once m controls were placed on entry, then the, then the, the uh, uh, then became essential to be able to document the means by which one entered the United States. And if one, one couldn't ha didn't have the, the documentary access, then it's very difficult to pursue citizenship uh, a, a quest for naturalization. And, and then as you show that you know, the, the naturalized and the non-naturalized population are over, overlapping. Uh, and, and that indeed the rights of citizens were, non-citizens get steadily, get, get steadily circumscribed. I, I mentioned to you that, you know, your book motivated me to go back to Libby Garland's book. And so she makes, I mean, and she also, as you know, has a chapter on, the, on Michigan's registration uh, legislation but she, you know, she also, I, I, I could be confused with your book, to tell you the truth, but, but my recollection is she's the one who makes the point that the 1940 Registration Act is the logical culmination of all of the efforts at restriction. And, and, and but uh, curiously, historians have basically neglected it. It's an afterthought. So I guess that's what I would like to hear your reflection. What, I mean, and I guess I would push you to be as bold as possible because I think it's a, it's a really terrific and very interesting book. So what do you, I mean, what do you think of the broader implications for the, for the historiography of American immigration, ethnicity, et cetera? Right, no, thank you so much for that question. And I think that 
um, people always ask me the whiteness question, right? They're like, oh, where do these people fit in? Are they white? Are they not? And again, as you're saying, like, I, you know, I agree with Thomas Guglielmo. I think that, uh, and I say that in the book, you know, these people were white. They were able to come and get American citizenship. Um, they were eligible, right? This is not, uh, but they are at the same time cast as foreign, right? And uh, they are cast with this shadow of uh, suspicion. They're linked to political radicalism in many cases and all of the things that, um, you know, casting people as foreign comes with, right? So that's, and I think that, I mean, that's the kind of historiographical uh, contribution I'd like to make to have a new, to kind of carve out this new category that goes beyond just uh, white and non-white, which were important categories and are becoming increasingly important at this time. Uh, but we also see uh, the creation of this category of the foreigner. At this time, um, Southern Eastern Europeans tend to be mapped uh, onto this category, uh, but, and, and yes, this does lead, I, I, I make the argument that this does lead to, uh, it's not the war, it's the, all of the politics of the 1930s that leads to uh, the Alien Registration Act in 1940. Uh, the war is just the excuse for something that uh, policymakers have been trying to get passed for years. And, uh, but uh, this new category of the foreigner uh, is something that begins to really matter politically in the United States at this time. And, is then after World War II, then maps onto racial categories, right? And uh, white Americans are able to kind of uh, cast, even if they have a non-citizen uh, grandparent or someone that came over in a, an irregular way, they're able to kind of distance themselves from that in a way that um, particularly uh, Lat Latinx and other Asian immigrants are unable to after uh, this time period. So, I mean, that's the, that's the focus, right, that I'd like to emphasize, that it's not this kind of emphasis on um, non-white versus uh, whiteness. Um, and it's not, I'm not saying that these people are not white, they are, uh, and they're eligible for, uh, for citizenship, they're eligible for inclusion in a lot of um, parts of American life. They're able to live most places that they want to in the city, um, particularly in Detroit, uh, but they're still facing levels of fear and scrutiny uh, that matter policy-wise later. Okay, thank you. I don't, are there other questions? I don't see anything else in the chat nor any hands up. Uh, okay, so on that note, let, why don't we bring this uh, discussion to a close? Uh, Kathy, another question. Go ahead. Just briefly, I, I did write this in the chat, but maybe I got lost. Did you say that there were only 50 agents between Port Huron and Toledo? No, Five there zero? were. Oh, yeah, 50 agents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not the very beginning. many. No, I mean, it's that's so... a huge space. Right. So one of the issues was that the early border patrol is uh, tremendously underfunded and there aren't that many agents uh, that are. No patrolling. wonder they were ineffective. Um, the area they later and they use this later to lobby for more funding and get uh, get this increased uh, dramatically over the course of the next decade, two decades, as we know. But but yes, the numbers are of actual agents that are in the early border patrol are, are small. Really tiny, thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us uh, for today's session. Thanks especially to uh, Ashley for a terrific presentation. So it's a, it's a wonderful book, so I strongly recommend it to uh, all of our listeners. Thanks for da to David for pinching, pinch hitting in the last moment uh, and coming up with such a, an insightful comment. I, I wanna remind everyone that we will meet again uh, actually, for each of the next three Fridays, so next Friday, a talk by Professor Nancy Green on transnationalism and walls, a workshop led by uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter Catron uh, on uh, looking at data link, immigration research using uh, 
using record linkage through the census. So uh, a, a very valuable new resource for conducting immigration research. And then for our final session, a, uh, a, a discussion of a new and terrific book, uh, The Border Within Vietnamese Migrants Transforming Ethnic Nationalism in Berlin by Phi Su. So with that, thanks everybody. Looking forward to seeing you next week and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.